it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all to this long awaited special event. Um, I'm Denise Gürkturk, uh, I'm a professor in the Department of German at UC Berkeley. And uh, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to our two international guests, Fatma Aydemir and Hengame uh, Yagubi Farah, um, who are joining us from Berlin and to John Cho Polizzi, the co-organizer and the, 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 the initiator and host uh, of this uh, event. So the spring semester here at Berkeley started this week and due to Omicron, we are back to remote teaching on Zoom for now. Uh, I suppose that applies to several of you out there. Um, and so this is our welcome back event. Uh, the, and um, the, the series, Archives of Migration, The Power of Fiction in Times of Fake News, um, which was designed as a um, series of transcontinental conversations uh, with contemporary writers. Um, has actually been enabled by our shift to real-time video communication. So uh, my colleague at UC Davis, Elisabeth Krimmer, Elisabeth uh, is out there. Um, and I started the series of Zoom conversations with um, writers under pandemic lockdown conditions in an effort to keep our minds alive and um, connected. So in February last year, we had our uh, very first event in this series with Sharon Dodua Otu and uh, John Tro Polizzi, um, who has in the meantime finished translating Otu's novel Ada, Kudos John. Uh, so the conversations continue. And today will be the seventh event uh, in this series. So the um, occasion for today's conversation is the publication of the English translation of all the texts from the anthology, Eure Heimat ist unser Erbtraum. Uh, this book here, um, Your Homeland uh, is our uh, nightmare in our electronic journal Transit. And you know, the uh, collection was edited by Hengame and uh, Fatma. Um, I'm gonna uh, do a screen share and show you uh, this Transit uh, edition um, to, to uh, make sure that everyone gets to see it. Okay. Oops. Did I do that? <laughs> so, uh, is it working? Yes. So, so the um, so Hengame and Hatma had um, assembled a group of 14 authors for a collective intervention against the climate of uh, rising nativism that culminated in the renaming of the German Ministry of the Interior um, as das Ministerium des Inneren für Bau und Heimat, uh, Homeland in 2018. John has been a driving force behind translating these powerful young, young voices into English and in line with the collective character of the anthology, he assembled a group of translators, as you can see on the screen. Um, and um, uh, the first installment of selected translations was actually published in transit uh, already in 2020. And now we have the, the complete uh, volume published on the website. It is actually the first time that Transit published a whole book um, rather than selections. And now we have the complete, um, so today's event is to celebrate 
the uh, collective labor that went into the volume and into the translations. So thanks to all the authors, uh, editors and translators. Uh, and I think some of them are actually joining us today. So you could uh, put yourselves in the, in the chat as contributors. Um, so I'll stop the screen share now. Yes. Um, so another occasion for today's conversation is the eminent publication of Fatma Aydemir's second novel, Jins, Jins, Jinlash, uh, uh, by Hansa Falak on February 14th. So you can already pre-order on the website I've seen. And uh, we will hear uh, a brief sneak preview uh, of, from that book today, uh, along with a, a short translation, I think. And um, Hengame's novel, Ministerium der Träume, uh, was published last year by Aufbau Verlag. And we are going to hear a passage from that book too. So the aim is uh, also to highlight the new production of fiction by these two author editors. Um, and before we start, I would like to quickly thank those who have made these events possible. The series was inaugurated um, with funding from the German consulate in San Francisco uh, last year. And this semester's program has been organized in cooperation with the Goethe Institute in San Francisco. So uh, warm thanks to Noemi Njangiru and Bettina Wodjanka for their support. Uh, Elizabeth and I would also like to thank our co-sponsors, the German Historical Institute, Pacific Regional Office, and the Institute for European Studies at UC Berkeley for their steady support of this venture, especially Heike Friedman and Ray Savard, who are managing the Zoom room and publicity as well as our home departments of German at UC Davis and UC Berkeley. Um, also our department manager, Sumalu, Su Sumali Tutrello. Um, so as the initi initiator uh, and um, uh, co-organizer of this event, John will now introduce Fatma Aydemir and Tengame Yagobi Farah. Uh, John holds a recent PhD from the graduate program in German at UC Berkeley with a dissertation titled A Different German Village, Writing Place Through Migration. Um, and he's been uh, you know, managing editor uh, and collaborator on the journal Transit for many years. Um, he is a, a prolific literary translator uh, also working on works by Jose Oliver, Max Trollek, and other writers. Um, and before I hand over to him, I should also mention that the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions um, uh, or share comments via the chat. Um, and we will keep, do our best to keep an eye on, on that. Um, and upcoming uh, events in the series um, will be Jenny Appenbeck, Jenny Appenbeck on March 18 and Mitu Sanyal on April 8. Um, so that's in the future. But uh, without further ado, um, John, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. Uh, hi, everyone. And thanks again, Denise, for your introduction. Um, at the risk of repeating anything, I would still like to take this opportunity to provide a bit more background on our two guest speakers today, as well as on the project which brought all of us into conversation over the past couple of years. So it's my great honor and privilege to introduce Fatma Aydemir and Hengame Yagubi Farah, two very talented authors in their own rights, as well as curators, editors, journalists, and activists whose work has already begun to leave its mark on the contemporary German language literary scene. We've been in communication and collaborated on a number of projects together over the past couple of years, but I think this is actually the first time we've had the opportunity to host or appear at an event together live. So I'm very happy that this finally came together. Um, Fatma Eidemir was born in Karlsruhe in Southwest Germany and studied both German and American studies 
Johann Wolfgang Goethe Universität in Frankfurt am Main. She is a regular contributor and editor for the Berlin-based Tageszeitung Taz, where she initiated the bilingual web portal Taz Gazette, which supports freedom of the press in Turkey, as well as a freelance writer for Specs and Missy Magazine. Her 2017 debut novel, Elbogen, Elbow, was awarded the Klaus Michael Kühne Prize for Best Debut Novel of the Year, as well as the Franz Hessel Prize for German Literature. And she's since been awarded the Jahres Stipendium für Schriftsteller for the German state of Baden-Württemberg and the Robert Gerhardt Prize for her current novel project, Jens. Shortly before the outbreak of the pandemic, she was also a writer in residence here in California in 2019 at the renowned Villa Aurora in Pacific Palisades. As Denise already mentioned, Fatma's forthcoming novel, Jins, from which she will be reading today, will be published on February 14th by Hansa Verlag. Ngame Jagobi Farah was born in Kiel in Northern Germany. They studied media, culture, and Scandinavian studies at the Albrecht Ludwigs Universität in Freiburg, as well as at the University of Linköping in Sweden. And they're an editor for Missy Magazine, as well as a regular contributor to Specs, Anschläge, and Tats, where they've published their own column, Habibitus, since 2016. In addition to their journalistic work, Hengame is an extensive online and social media presence, contributing to the blog Queer Vanity, as well as recording a weekly podcast, Auf eine Tüte, from 2020 through the end of 2021, which brought together a very star studded cast of German celebrities and public intellectuals to discuss a really broad variety of social and pop cultural subjects, as well as tasty snacks, which combines the author's unique style of hard hitting social commentary and humor in short digestible sound bites, which certainly do not guarantee either easy listening or ease of consumption. And Gami's debut novel, Ministerium der Träume, Ministry of Dreams, was published with Blumenbach Verlag in February of 2021. So, as Afer mentioned, in addition to their own literary works, both Fatma and Hengame also co-edited the 2019 volume, Eure Heimat ist unser Altraum, Your Homeland is Our Nightmare, an expansive response to the renaming of Germany's Ministry of the Interior to the Ministry of Homeland, which brought together 14 contemporary German-speaking authors to discuss the ongoing significance of the historically weighted word Heimat from a truly diverse and intersexual range of perspectives. So for those of our viewers who are new to the discourse on Heimat, the German word for homeland, has a long and storied history and has for several centuries now been deeply tied to constructs of German nationalism, concepts of cultural homogeneity, and the conservative denial of the realities of Germany's multilingual and multivalent present day. And its invocation has been a driving force behind the political far right from the anti-Semitism which tainted 19th century German unification to the blood and soil discourse of national socialism, as well as the current re-emergence of fascist politics with reactionary political parties like the far right alternative for Germany, who champion their own exclusionary vision for the German homeland as a rallying cry against immigrants, refugees, international cooperation, or simply the lived reality of life in a diverse society like that of 21st century Germany. Your Homeland is Our Nightmare invited 14 authors to write a response to recent attempts to mainstream the use of the word Heimat as an attempt to reappropriate, destigmatize, or de-weaponize the term away from the arsenal of the ascendant right. And each author organized their thoughts around a specific word or term which speaks to their own experience of the German homeland, containing essay contributions with titles such as love, trust, danger, insult, sex, or food, the collection bridges the divide between literature, scholarly intervention, and public discourse, allowing even those uninitiated to the conversation to engage through the personal nature of these commentaries and begin to ask themselves, even in a broader transnational context, just what a concept like homeland truly brings to the lived reality of 21st century life. Although it is not the first, or last of such polyphonic interventions by contemporary German language writers, it remains perhaps the most accessible to readers outside the confines of the German speaking world. Its themes speak to the universality of marginalization 
and also resistance across borders, languages, and lived experience. In late 2019, I began to organize a team of graduate students at the University of California, Berkeley, and later teamed up with the graduate seminar at the University of Arizona in Tucson to translate these essays, publishing an initial selection online from remote locations during the first weeks of the coronavirus pandemic in the spring of 2020. Now, nearly two years later, following an extremely positive reception of this initial project and the incorporation of a number of these translations into university syllabi across both the US and UK, Berkeley's Transit Journal, in cooperation with the German publishers Ulstein Verlag, published the entire 14 essay collection in translation, a labor of love which I re-edited in its entirety for the second publication. We brought together a diverse team of volunteers, professional and amateur translators alike, working across three continents in a cooperation which I hope, in many ways, does justice to the power and intersectionality of the German language original. Our conversation today, at least as we've envisioned it, will include both a discussion of the original collection and its translation, as well as the author's individual works. And we're going to begin with a reading from Hengame's Blicke, followed by an excerpt from its English translation, Looks, translated by my former colleague, Dr. Jonas Toypat, who is now an assistant professor at the National University in Taiwan. We'll follow that up with a discussion of the Heimat collection, its reception, and further circulation in the English-speaking world, before transitioning to readings from both Fatma and Hengame's most recent novels. Hengame, the floor is yours. Thanks for the invitation and the introduction. Um, okay, I'm just gonna start. Blicke. Umgeben von lauter TouristInnen laufen eine Freundin und ich durch das Museumsviertel einer westdeutschen Stadt. Hier gibt es zig Ausstellungen, aber keine kann mit der Attraktion mithalten, die anscheinend von meinem Körper ausgeht. Neben bohrenden Blicken fallen mir ein paar Annikas auf, die ihre Smartphones auf mich richten und ohne meine Erlaubnis Fotos von mir machen, als würde ich ein Banksy Graffiti. Ey, ich wurde schon wieder fotografiert. Hau nicht der Freundin zu. Sie mustert mich. Ich glaube, das liegt an einem Outfit. Die sind so einen crazy Style einfach nicht gewöhnt. Meine Ästhetik ist vieles. Sie ist Camp. Sie ist queer, sie ist femme, sie ist das beliebte Kind aus der Mittelstufe im Jahr 2003 und gleichzeitig die Außenseiterin von 2007. Aber crazy? Für ein Kloster-Retreat vielleicht, aber nicht für eine europäische Großstadt, wo es Menschen gibt, die in Clownskostümen oder als Kupferstatuen geschminkt unterwegs sind. Zwischen all den Junggesellen in Abschieden bin ich fast schon eine graue Maus, protestiere ich. Ich trage nun wirklich nichts, was sonst niemand anhat. Dennoch gehören Situationen, in denen ich von Umstehenden angestarrt oder ohne mein Einverständnis fotografiert werde, mittlerweile zu meinem Alltag. Ich werde als anders wahrgenommen, als fremd. Aus welchem Grund weiß ich nie genau. Hängt es damit zusammen, dass ich dick bin? Dass ich queer bin? Dass ich Kanakin bin? Oder liegt es wirklich an meinem Style? Vielleicht ist es auch alles zusammen. Vielleicht ist eine dicker, queerer Kanakin mit einem Bombenoutfit zu viel Schock für Annika. Aber sind diese Zuschreibungen überhaupt alle auf den ersten Blick ersichtlich? Klar, meine Speckröllchen und mein Doppelkinn kann ich nicht verstecken. Aber als ich mich aber dass ich mich weder als Frau noch als Mann identifiziere, steht mir nicht auf der Stirn geschrieben. Die meiste Zeit lesen andere mich als Cis-Frau. Und auch Weißsein liegt oft im Auge der Betrachtenden. Etwa dann, wenn bestimmt wird, was vermeintlich ein deutsches Aussehen ausmacht. Natürlich sehen nicht alle weißen Deutschen aus wie das Kind auf der Rotbäckchensaftflasche. Doch sobald jemand dunkle Haare hat, die mehr als ein Kammstrich dick sind, die Nase nicht nur ein kleiner runder Knopf ist und die Hautfarbe um eine Nuance von Mayo abweicht, findet ein Prozess statt, der sich Othering im Allgemeinen und Rassifizierung im Konkreten nennt. Blicke scan dich ab und du merkst, the Kenneck is present. Nun ist meine Haut genauso Mayo wie die von Annika. 
Wenn ich meinen Namen nicht verkünde, werde ich im Gegensatz zu meinen Eltern manchmal als südeuropäisch, manchmal schlicht als weiß gelesen. Ich bekomme nicht einmal einen Bruchteil der rassistischen Gewalt ab, die Menschen entgegenschlägt, die von Colorism betroffen sind, die also wirklich aufgrund von Hautfarbe abgewertet werden. Meine Hautfarbe wird weder auf eine entmenschlichende Art mit Lebensmitteln verglichen, noch mit Schmutz. Die Grenze des Weißseins verläuft immer parallel zu den Machtstrukturen in einer jeweiligen Gesellschaft. Die Zuordnung hängt häufig von Geografien ab und vom geschichtlichen Kontext. In Deutschland bin ich nicht weiß, im Iran schon. Dort werde ich nicht aufgrund einer vermeintlichen ethnischen Zugehörigkeit diskriminiert, denn da gehöre ich zur Mehrheitsgesellschaft. Manchmal aber bestimmt die Blickrichtung, wo ich sozial positioniert werde. Wie, ich auf magische Weise, wie, wie auf magische Weise kann mein Standpunkt innerhalb der Gesellschaft also komplett switchen, ohne dass ich mich selbst bewegt hätte. Auch als weiß gelesen werden zu können, bedeutet aber, dass weiße Deutsche dich immer so einordnen, wie es für sie gerade bequem oder gar vorteilhaft ist. Wenn sie mir unangebrachte Fragen über meine wirkliche Herkunft oder wahlweise auch die Safranpreise im Iran stellen wollen, bin ich Kanakin. Wenn ich mit meiner Familie unterwegs bin, bin ich Kanakin. Auf der Wohnungssuche oder bei der Passkontrolle bin ich definitiv Kanakin. Und wenn Leute über den Nahostkonflikt diskutieren oder sich über Integration unterhalten wollen, bin ich auch ganz klar Kanakin. Da bringe ich scheinbar qua Gene die inhaltliche Kompetenz mit, um schon als Teenager in, in Gesprächen mit weißen Erwachsenen hineingezogen zu werden, die mich um eine Einschätzung der aktuellen Krise bitten. Natürlich darf ich dabei nicht vergessen, mich im selben Atemzug von dem Verhalten der unterschiedlichen Parteien in der Krise zu distanzieren. Nicht, dass ich mich noch irgendwie verdächtig mache und, auf, und Bescheidwissen mit Identifikation verwechselt wird. Es ist schmeichelhaft, dass mir schon in einem frühen Alter zugetraut wurde, mich neben dem Schulalltag, den Klickendynamiken, Depressionen und Hobbys auch mit dem politischen Weltgeschehen auseinanderzusetzen. Oder sagen Sie, es wäre schmeichelhaft, würde es nicht zugleich implizieren, dass ich bereits in der Mittelstufe ein Allgemeinwissen vorweisen musste, das nicht einmal den meisten weißdeutschen Erwachsenen abverlangt wird. Es gibt bei mir allerdings auch den umgekehrten Effekt. Wenn ich Rassismus kritisiere, gelte ich in den Augen weißer Deutscher plötzlich selber als weiß. Und es wird vermutet, dass ich gar nicht wüsste, wie sich Rassismus wirklich anfühlt. Das Absprechen von Erfahrungen und Identitäten soll dazu dienen, meiner Kritik die Legitimation zu entziehen. Dieses Silencing ist eine Methode von Menschen in Machtpositionen, die es Betroffenen von Diskriminierung unmöglich macht, ihre Erfahrungen auszusprechen. Denn ich bin ihnen entweder zu aufgewühlt, um vernünftig darüber sprechen zu können oder zu gefasst, um tatsächlich betroffen zu sein. Die Leute, die versuchen, meine politischen Analysen abzuwehren und abzuwerten, indem sie mich als weiß fremd definieren, sind dieselben, die meinen Namen nicht aussprechen können und in den ersten zwei Minuten des Kennenlernens wissen wollen, wo ich denn eigentlich wirklich herkomme. Ob Sie Annika aus Wuppertal das auch fragen? Auf Englisch gibt es den Ausdruck White Gaze, um den weißen Blick zu bezeichnen. Richtet sich der White Gaze auf Personen of Color, definiert und bewertet er sie aus einer weißen Perspektive. Dieser weiße Blick zeigt sich, wenn ein weißer Polizist einen Kanacken sieht und ihn aus heiterem Himmel nach seinen Papieren fragt. Oder wenn eine weiße Frau in der U-Bahn sich an ihre Handtasche klammert, weil gerade eine Romney einsteigt. Aber auch wenn weiße Studierende einer schwarzen, einer schwarzen Person begegnen und plötzlich anfangen, in einem aufgesetzten Slang und merkwürdig gestikulierend mit ihr zu sprechen. Es ist bezeichnend, dass der Begriff White Gaze wie White Gaze klingt, denn auch in queeren Räumen sind nicht alle gleich. Hier werden genauso Rassismen reproduziert wie woanders. Vielen People of Color, vor allem Femme, wird Queerness abgesprochen und das auch von anderen Queers. Die weiße Dominanzgesellschaft kaut schon lange an einem Mysterium, das nicht einmal Ayman Abdallah für sie lösen kann. Wenn KanakInnen 
immer homofeindlich und nie queer sind, wie können dann Menschen wie ich existieren? Thank you so much for that reading. Uh, I'm just going to read a very short excerpt from Jonas Teupert's translation. Someone's gaze scans over you, and you realize Anak is present. Now, my skin is just as mayo as Anika's. Unlike my parents, I'm sometimes read as Southern European, sometimes simply as white. As long as I don't say my name, I don't receive even a fraction of the racist violence that impacts people affected by colorism those who are actually denigrated on the basis of their skin color. My skin color doesn't get compared in a dehumanizing manner to either groceries or dirt. I don't stand out as a Kanakin immediately, as do other people in my family. The borders of whiteness always run parallel to the power structures of their respective society. The attribution of whiteness often depends on geographies and historical context. In Germany, I'm not white. In Iran, I am. There, I'm not discriminated against according to perceived ethnic belonging because I'm part of the majority. Yet sometimes, perspective decides where I'm situated socially. As if by magic, my position in society can switch completely without me moving at all. But being readable as white also means that white Germans will always categorize you in whatever way is convenient or even advantageous for them. When they want to ask me inappropriate questions about where I'm really from, or alternatively, about the saffron prices in Iran, I'm a Kanakin. When I'm out with my family, I'm a Kanakin. Hunting for an apartment or passing through border control, I'm definitely a Kanakin. And when people debate about the conflict in the Middle East or talk about integration, I am most certainly a Kanakin too. In such instances, I seem to have expertise coded in my DNA, so much so that even as a teenager, I was drawn into discussions with white adults who asked me for my assessment of the current crisis. Needless to say, I should never forget to distance myself in the same breath from all parties involved in said crisis, lest I somehow render myself suspicious when being in the know gets confused with being in cahoots. Okay, so thank you, Hengame. You know, I think already in this brief extract, you start to see a little bit of the overall intervention that a collection like this is making, and certainly the resistance to it as well. Uh, challenging norms, but not just in terms of challenging the German Dominanzkultur, but also in terms of how that dominant lens tends to universalize and homogenize the experience of those whom it marginalizes, and how those experiences become staged or written over in a way that attempts to take away individual agency. And I think that what this collection is doing is taking these 14 very different perspectives on our German or, you know, also Austrian present day and saying, you know, our strength here is in our diversity of experience and the diversity of positionalities. And we don't necessarily have to share in or agree on everything, but we have to share in this core belief that each and every one of our individual perspectives matters. And I'm thinking here more largely in terms of something like what Max Cholek calls Gegenbats Bewältigung, this process of refashioning or taking ownership over the narratives of the present in a way which you know, also acknowledges that the present day informs not just our future, but also the way we look back at the past and our commitment to not allowing history to repeat itself. And I think in this context, that means very actively working to acknowledge the diversity of perspectives which Germany has always had um, but which we have at various points, including still today, always struggled to acknowledge or to bring to public attention. And I think perhaps writing from a diversity of narratives over this universalizing trend of Dominanzkultur, uh, and in a way one might say actually writing yourselves into this Heimat narrative as well, even as you're mobilizing against it. So I think this sort of brings us to the first question which Denise and I talked about, um, and it's something that I think we can all have a conversation about, but where do both of you really see this intervention of today? And uh, to what extent have these issues changed, improved, or even gotten worse with the pandemic and the recent change in the German federal government? Maybe that's something we can start out talking about. 
if I if I may briefly add to that, I think you know you know the question is also uh, whether this anthology is debunking Heimat, the notion of Heimat, or whether it's actually claiming it and and you know so re trying to reappropriate it. Um, so uh, and yes, I would be also interested in where that whole debate stands today uh, in your eyes. Um, but let's start first with the, what what the you know the anthology was aiming to do at when it was first published. Mm -hmm. Most of you can come in there. Yeah, okay. I, can, I can. I can. You start. can. Okay. Yeah, I, I think I'll start with the last question and then go backwards. Sure. Um, <laughs> I think yeah. I mean, our um, aim or. Maybe I start with the other one. So I, actually, our aim was to um, to do an essay collection, to um, make you know, to publish literary essays from authors that we um, admire a lot, um, and mm, to reflect um, from that. Um, point in time, it was 2018 when we worked on the book and 2019 when it was published. Um, and the elections of 2017 just had taken place where, you know, the AfD, the right wing party moved into the parliament for the first time. It was not the first time that, you know, um, uh, people from the right wing were in the parliament, but like as an organized party openly supporting um, fascist ideology, it was like the first time after World War II. So that was a very historical moment. And we wanted to, you know, uh, bring together perspectives from authors, from literary authors. And um, I was just one of a few ideas that we had um to you know have like a one topic that can um that tells something about this historical moment because uh, it was not only about you know that uh, extremist party but it was also about this mainstream thing or about the political system in general uh by renaming the 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 interior ministry um so yeah it's after talking to several authors and talking to the publisher, um, we um, had the feeling, okay, Heimat is maybe the right way to go, to use Heimat in order to speak about the political climate of that time. And um, our aim was certainly to debunk Heimat. And um, we say that, I think, in the foreword also that um, we both, don't think, hang on me, that um, it is actually possible to reclaim Heimat for progressive um, politics. And the reason that we said that is um, that in the um, election campaigns uh, of 2017, um, actually the Green Party and the, the, the Die Linke actually also partly um, tried to work with Heimat as well. So there was like this whole trend um, also from the left um, to, you know, reclaim this word in order to create, I don't know, a sense of belonging or to use it for a new, more modern and more progressive form of nationalism, let's say. Um, and yes, yeah, so our position was um, no, we don't want any nationalism. We don't want the modern one. We don't want the green one. We don't want, you know, the inclusive, good looking, colorful one. None of it. Uh, because, yeah, so maybe maybe we already come to today because there has been another election um, just in September. And I think that um, in this election campaign, we didn't hear the word Heimat that often. And um yeah i don't know if it has anything to do with um our book or the work we have to, done in the last years because we have been invited to a lot of places and we're you know debunking high mat on all stages that were <laughs> uh, presented to us but um yeah it's not it's it's the the term itself is 
um, not as commonly used as it used to be a few years ago, I think, um, when it comes to political parties, but it's still around. And um, the name of the ministry wasn't changed. And I think uh, even if the word Heimat is not being used, that there is like with this new government also, um, I sense um, the urge to, you know, um, towards a more, let's say, uh, modern form, progressive form, or green form of nationalism, and which um, some immigrants or some people are included in order to defend borders against other people who should not enter the country. I don't know, Hengami, what would you say? Do you want to add something? I don't have so much to add. The only thing that came to my mind was that um, you're right. They In the last elections, parties didn't use the term Heimat so often, or like the more progressive ones didn't. But for example, the um, image film for the Green Party, they didn't say Heimat, but it was screaming Heimat from every image that was used because they were just like filming all kinds of like diverse people in like forests and different city uh, like settings uh, settings to um like the message was kind of the same but they used the different rhetoric um but as you said the fact that they didn't change back the name of the ministry already says a lot because it was definitely not necessary to keep it mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I would I would still, you know, sort of press you a little bit on on this question of uh, you know debunking or uh, or repurposing because a lot, I I do see the gesture in in a lot of the the texts in the anthology uh, of of also claiming that we 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 are here we want to feel at home here and we we want to participate you know so so I mean. That seems to be really the kind of uh, driving force, in my opinion, uh, when I read these pieces. And uh, for instance, yours on Heim, our Arbeit, uh, uh, Fatma. And so, so it also, um, so, so it's it's not just about debunking the myth, but also saying we have to kind of. Uh, Create a new sense of belonging, I guess, um, or or we have to, uh, you know, sort of make that accessible to uh, a greater diversity of uh, participants. Um, yeah, uh, so that's that's my my caveat. Yeah, there. but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I mean, you're right, Dennis, but um, in a, but I wouldn't say that. Um, I wouldn't say that you, it is necessary to claim Heimat as a concept or the words in order to do that. And I wouldn't even say um, that it is like, um, the book is there to say that we want to participate or um, feel at home, but actually to say that we are already partic participating, you know, and I already feel like feel at home. I don't know I, if I, yeah, at home is better to say that uh, than to say this is my Heimat, but um, it's like uh, John said that in the, the intro introduction um, earlier that um, it's actually about, you know, what is your point of view to the already existing reality in Germany? And I think that, yeah, hang on me. The, the, can I give over to you because I'm a bit confused. Mm -hmm. I would say it's a lot about agency and self-confidence. It's not like the authors aren't like asking for participation or like um, being like we did, we or our parents or grandparents did all of these things to build this country so we need a seat at the table. But, but like the kind of confidence that the authors bring is more like uh, we are the table and let's see if you can sit with us 
Be and that's what I like about it because often mm, not necessarily from their own perspectives, but from a per, from the perspective of like the dominant society, uh, marginalized people or like especially like uh, racialized people tend to be seen as victims or people that you that are still guests in this country and you're like allowing in and um, the way they are expected to talk about certain topics is also from like an inferior perspective or like um, not on eye level and I feel like many um, racialized people who try to like reclaim the Heima term uh, feed to this like devotion of um, like I don't want to sound pathologizing and being like um, and saying they have like internalized self-hate or racism but it definitely does not come from a place of meeting people on an eye level like white Germans on an eye level and um, instead of asking um, is for a seat at the table just taking the seat or maybe even saying your table sucks. The food you serve is gross and bland, and we're gonna start our own table. Yeah, I mean, I, I completely agree. I think that very few of these texts really make any attempt to to sort of empower or reappropriate the word Heimat, but you're coming up with new discourses around belonging and community that don't need a word like that. Right? And you're defining it by your own terms. And I think that's something that's really, really interesting about this whole collection. Uh, and Gami, if I could, I, I wanted to ask you a question about your writing, um, because one thing that I think you see here, reading your work in both German or English translation, is the way in which you, along with you know, a number of other contemporary writers, have really foregrounded the mm -hmm. politics of gender in your language, uh, normalizing the use of something like the gender gap or star or colon and making gender politics not merely visible, but also a really integral part of your writing itself. And I mean, we see the power of that, not merely in the way that it's changing the language, but also in the kind of resistance that you face to that, right? Like we would have trolls coming into an academic talk to try and interrupt you, it just really shows the power of the intervention that you're making. And I think that's a really important thing to recognize. Um, but I wonder, you know, German being such a heavily grammatically gendered language, um, this intervention really comes alive in the way that you write, um, but in a way which can be sort of challenging to conceptualize for someone that doesn't speak German um, or someone that's not familiar with the way that German works. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the way that you write, about the way that you conceptualize gender through language, um, because I think that's something that really defines your voice as a writer. Um, I mean, it's not like I came up with the way of like um, seeing or like talking about gender differently than in the binary or often just like androcentric way um, and different uh, linguists and like feminist activists have been working on it for, sen uh, for decades. And I'm basically like, um, I grew up um, in like political anti-fascist context even when I went to school. So this is how when I started to write and like publish, this was already um, my standard, so to say. And uh, like even in school, I would write that way. Um, and for me, it's um, I don't even make a big politic out of it. Like, I wouldn't say it's um, super radical to do that. And, but I mean, if even, I mean, trolls are triggered by all kinds of things. So like, um, like we can't take their sad lives as a standard, but I would say that, especially when it comes to literature and not just like journalistic texts, or academic texts, but um, texts like poetry or, or like po poetry or um, novels, there is um, way more resistance to 
bring progressive, not just um, gender sensitive, but also um, sensitive or like political language in general into it. But um, I mean, Sharon Dodua too is another writer or Miku Sanyal who are um, using gender sensitive language in their novels and Bef and I mean, all, all, all of all our three novels came out last year, but even before that, we had Schwarzrund, for example, which is also an Afro-German author. And um, I would say, instead of discussing if it's possible, if it makes the reading harder or not, we should just like do it and find poetic ways of um, breaking the binary that the German language has in it but I mean you can language changes and we can totally work on it and the more authors participate in it the more it will be normalized or like less unconventional it will be yeah no I think that that's absolutely right because you you do this very consequentially and very consistently in your work and I think that sort of foregrounding that in literature is a really important thing you know, for those of us that are teaching German as a foreign language, having good examples of work like this that we can teach in the classroom is a really important thing. And that's something which, you know, yes, we can find these examples from previous, you know, theoretical literature and stuff, but to find good contemporary literature and journalism that respects these sort of rules is critical for us. So I think it's a really important thing that you're doing there. Thanks. Maybe I, I one more thing to, to add. Uh, oh, sorry. sorry. <laughs> you go ahead. Just <laughs> one sentence. I think it also, when it comes to literature, depends on the kind of literature that you're writing. If I was writing from, a po from the point of view of a misogynistic person, for example, or someone who's transphobic, they would not use gender sensitive language, of course. But the novel that I wrote is from the perspective of like a middle aged lesbian bouncer and um, that's how she speaks and also sings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I, I just wanted to flag that in, in Turkish and I think also in Farsi, the, there is no uh, gendered pronouns, you know, uh, so, so, and Fatma's novel actually uh, really kind of stages that uh, the possibilities that that indeterminacy opens up uh, also, you know, so uh, it's it's good to think comparatively about language use in in, uh, in this respect. Um, um, uh, I, I also wanted to come back to something that uh, if uh, John allows and if it fits. <laughs> so to, to something uh, that you said, uh, Hengame, um, that we we are the table. Uh, so so uh, so so the construction of we there is interesting, of course. You know, so who is we? Uh, but um, also, I, I've been thinking. You know, so since your text employs Kanak quite a bit, uh, you know, I've been thinking about Kanak attack in the 1990s as. Uh, a trans-ethnic alliance and uh, interventionist activist movement. Um, and uh, Kanak Atak, uh, so what has changed since Kanak Atak? You know, so uh, there is this reclaiming of that uh, sort of uh, derogatory designation uh, also going on in your text. Uh, and one, one shift I see is also media, uh, you know, uh, media related, you know, so, uh, Kanakatak was, you know, sort of the early days of, of internet video. They did a few with Kanak TV. Uh, but uh, nowadays, you are, you know, the we is also constructed in an inter in a way that is much more networked through social media, right? So, um, uh, and uh, your, your, so, so, so has it, gotten easier to, to, to build uh, a collective force with uh, Twitter and Facebook and Instagram and uh, all that, you know, so since you're both also drawing on popular culture quite a bit in your writing and referencing popular culture, um, 
I, I'd be interested to hear a little bit about uh, the role of media in, in kind of building that collectivism, uh, collective activism. Mm -hmm. Um, I can start, I mean, I can start with uh, the we that you mentioned, because the we that we use in our book, or even in the title Eure Heimat is unser Altran, like the you and us, um, it's not built on identities, it's for whoever agrees with the idea of like an anti-nationalist, anti-fascist, um, idea of society. It's not a, necessarily about us, the racialized versus them, the white people. Um, because identity is very fragile and not everyone who has a certain identity has certain politics. Um, as we can see uh, with many different politicians, starting with like the lesbian head of the right wing party or um, our ex cancellor uh, Mer Angela Merkel, who was not necessarily a feminist, uh, but a woman. Um, and when it comes to networking or like community building, I can only speculate because in the 90s I was um, like not even in primary school or like in the end of the 90s I came there and I don't have the experience of how did people connect. But um, I think, I mean, if you talk to older activists, which I did for the research of my novel, for example, you will hear um, pros and cons for both. Like now a lot of things happen online. I mean, specifically now during the pandemic, but then there's like less street activism happening or like IRL meetings or activism at all uh, in certain questions, but also uh, when it comes to finding other people, it's definitely easier and more accessible online because um, I have the privilege, or both Fatma and I have the privilege of living in Berlin where there's different, not just like one anti-racist community or one queer or one feminist community, but very, very different ones. And if you're living in a more rural or even like small town area in Germany, you do not have that variety of political groups, but then it helps to find people who um, have similar politics or ideas or interests as you online. Mm. So yeah, there's pros and cons. I don't know, do you wanna add something Fatma? Um, no, just a little thing maybe that um, it is, um, yeah, you, you find people you in uh, online, you, you can form, form collectives uh, through that, but also I have the feeling that there's just so much um, arguing and discussing and debating about like unnecessary yeah. things happening because um, discussions are repeating themselves online, I think every t 10 minutes. <laughs> And uh, instead of, you know, informing about all the discussions that have been going on in the past, people just start um, asking the same questions um, as if they're the first ones to ask. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but yeah I would also add to that, especially because you mentioned Kanak attack. I mean, if you read their manifesto mm -hmm. and look at what we're debating today, some people have not gotten the memo from the 90s yet and like are having so many different discussions. I feel like once a year, twi German Twitter is discussing whether or not it is racist to ask someone where they come from. And I'm so tired of like having this discussion when there's different things happening. And I think it um, makes people tired. And I, I mean, I'm 30, there's people who have been uh, in active, politically active for way longer. And um, some of them become reactionary, some of them become tired. Um, <laughs> I definitely can um, relate with like becoming tired from like the repetitive 
he had basic discussions um, and when we were talking about how is the Heimat term today, I, I'm not even like in loop with that discussion anymore. Like I'm way more concerned about the rebranding of the green M&M than with that discussion uh, currently. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's that's funny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, good. So, uh, so I, in fact, I mean, another thing that has changed, I think, in comparison to the '90s, uh, is that um, you know the you and the other authors in your uh, in your circle uh, have really arrived. You know, so, I mean, the books are being published by Hansa Falak. Uh, I remember the days when I was kind of, you know, touring those German publishers with translations from Turkish under my arm. And everybody was saying, oh, these Turkish autoren schreiben doch alle wie im 19th Jahrhundert. You know, Turkish authors all write like in the 19th century and, you know, nobody is interested in that stuff. So, uh, so that, you know, there, there is a different level of recognition and uh, and also you know sort of um, uh, public access to publication now than there was back then um, and so so that's probably also a good place to to shift uh, uh, or, or our, our discussion to the new literary production uh, since time is uh, running, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, talk a little bit about, um, um, or or also hear hear a cost probe of the forthcoming novel. Is that the the next step, right? Um, and uh, talk a bit about what happens when these multilingual memories of migration hit center stage. <laughs> so. Um, uh, so shall we um, hear um, the, the excerpt from Jin's now to give us a flavor and then uh, John's translation, right? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a very short excerpt. It's um, actually the first page. Hussein. Weißt du, wer du bist, Hussein, wenn du die glänzenden Konturen deines Gesichts im Glas der Balkon zu erkennen. Wenn du die Tür öffnest, auf den Balkon trittst und die warme Luft über das Gesicht streicht und die untergehende Sonne zwischen den Dächern der Wohnblocks von Seetenbohne leuchtet, wie eine gigantische Apfelsine, du reibst dir die Augen. Vielleicht denkst du, vielleicht war jede Hürde und jeder Zwiespalt in diesem Leben nur dazu da, um irgendwann hier oben zu stehen und zu wissen, ich habe mir das verdient, mit dem Schweiß meiner Stirn. Du hast den ersten Abend Abendessern auf dem Balkon deiner Wohnung, deiner geräumigen 3 plus 1 Zimmerwohnung, im vierten Stock, für die, für die du fast 30 Jahre gearbeitet und gespart hast. Während du vier Kinder aufgezogen und deiner Frau zwar ein bescheidenes, aber nie notdürftiges Leben geboten hast. Du hast deine Tage in drei Schicht Schichten gelebt zu sehen hast alle Sonntagsdienste, Feiertagsdienste, Überstunden übernommen, hast von allen vorhandenen Zulagen in der Metallfabrik zu profitieren versucht, um die Familie durchzubringen, um den kleinen Fußballschuhe zu kaufen, um die Schulden des Großen zu begleichen, um ein bisschen was zur Seite zu legen. Und nun hast du es endlich geschafft. Du bist 59 und Eigentümer. Wenn in ein paar Jahren Ümit die Schule beendet und du endlich Deutschland dieses kalte Herzlose Land verlassen kann, dann gibt es die Wohnung hier in Istanbul mit deinem Namen auf dem Klingelschild. Hussein. Du hast endlich einen Ort gefunden, den du dein Zuhause nennen kannst. Genieße es, Hussein. Hör, wie die laute Musik aus dem Leben der Straße unter dir plötzlich verstummt und da nur noch der Esan ist und die Hupen und Stimmen von Millionen von Menschen, die weiter durch die Straßen irren, um ihren Geschäften nachzugehen. Lausch dem Geschrei der Möwen. Saug die schwüle Luft ein, die nach Abgasen und verbranntem Müll riecht. Lass deinen Blick ruhig noch ein paar Minuten auf dem Gewusel da unten zwischen den Häusern ruhen, bevor du beten gehst. Du, Hüssing, hast schon gewusst, dass du irgendwann nach Istanbul zurückkehren würdest, als du das erste Mal hier ankamst. Du, kamst, du nahmst damals den Zug aus dem Dorf und stiegst hier in Istanbul für eine Woche bei Verwandten ab, 
und stiegst hier in Istanbul für eine Woche bei Verwandten ab, ehe du den Bus und dann die Bahn nach Süddeutschland nahm, um sie dort eine Arbeitsstelle zuweisen zu lassen. Sie haben dich in eine Reihe mit anderen Arbeitern gestellt, haben eure nackten Körper inspiziert und euch in die Unterhosen geschaut. Das war im Frühjahr 1971. Deutschland war nicht das, was du dir erhofft hattest zu sehen. Du hattest dir ein neues Leben erhofft. Was du bekamst, war Einsamkeit, die nie ein neues Leben sein kann. Denn Einsamkeit ist eine Schleife, ist die ständige Wiederholung derselben Erinnerungen im Kopf, ist die Suche nach immer neuen Wunden in längst entschwundenen Ich, ist die Sehnsucht nach Menschen, die man zurückgelassen hat. Aber was solltest du tun mit denen? Du konntest nicht einfach zurück in dein Dorf, also bliebst du und hast das, was du tun musstest, damit dein Herkommen wenigstens einen Sinn ergab. Dankeschön. Thank you. Thanks, Fatma. I'm going to just read, I guess, pretty much the same excerpt now from the English translation. Begins. Hussein, do you know who you are, Hussein, when you see the shining contours of your face and the reflection on the balcony door? When you open the door, stride across the balcony and a warm breeze caresses your face and the setting sun glimmers between the rooftops of the apartments in Setinburnu like a giant tangerine. You rub your eyes, maybe you're thinking, maybe every obstacle and every conflict in this life was only there so that one day you could stand up here and know, I've earned this for myself with the sweat of my brow. You hear the first evening call to prayer from the balcony of this apartment, this spacious three bedroom apartment on the fourth floor, the apartment you worked and saved for almost 30 years while raising your four children and providing your wife and albeit humble, but never meager life. You lived your days to the rhythm of three shifts, Hussein. You took on every Sunday, every holiday, overtime, took advantage of every available bonus in the metalworks to get your family by, to buy new football cleats for the little one, to pay off the older one's debts and still set a little something aside. And now you've finally done it. You're 59 and a homeowner. In a few years, when Umit finishes school and you can finally leave Germany, this cold, cold-hearted country. There'll be an apartment waiting for you in Istanbul with your name at the door, Hussein. You finally found a place you can call home. Enjoy it, Hussein. Listen as the blaring music from the shops and the streets below grows quiet. Now there is only the azan. The azan and the honking and the cries of the millions who still must navigate the streets and go about the business of their days. Hear the calling of the gulls, inhale the humid air, tinged with exhaust and the smell of burning rubbish. Let your gaze fall for a few moments on the bustle between the houses below before you go yourself to pray. You already knew that someday you would return to Istanbul. Already the first time you arrived in the city back then, you'd come by train from your village. You disembarked for a week, you stayed here with relatives before you boarded the bus and then the train to Southern Germany where you'd be assigned a job. They put you in a line with other workers there. They inspected your naked bodies and they examined the contents of your underpants. That was in the spring of 1971. Germany was not what you had hoped it would be, Hussein. You'd hoped for a new life, but what you received instead was loneliness. Loneliness can never be a new life, for loneliness is a cycle the constant repetition of the same memories inside your head, the perpetual search for new wounds within your long departed ego, the longing for those people you left behind, but what could you do, Hussein? You couldn't just return back to your village, and so you stayed, and you did the things you had to do so that your coming here would at least make sense. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Yeah, I don't know how much we want to disclose of this novel. Uh, I, I, I had the privilege of reading a preview PDF and uh, I, uh, I very warmly recommend it because it's, it really kind of interweaves this family history and things don't turn out the way they are planned, right? So uh, the, this family history with, with kind of moments of migration history, uh, it's, it's really, um, um, a wonderful 
um, uh, book. Uh, so, um, Fatma, did you would you want to say something uh, about the, the the narrative as a whole, or should we just encourage people to to pre-order the book? Now? <laughs> well, we we can like talk like shortly, briefly about yeah, it. Yeah, if you want to say a few words about it, yeah, we can do both. Right. Yeah. <laughs> we can do, but you know. So maybe in your words, what what uh, what should people know about the novel at this point? <laughs> um, well, so what I read is just um, yeah. What is the beginning of of the book? It's not a spoiler to say um, that uh, Hussein will die on the first uh, ten pages of the book. It's um, because it's actually written on the back of the book too. Mm -hmm. um, so after Hussein dies in that uh, apartment, his family will meet there for his funeral. And um, my idea was to give every character, like his kids and his wife, um, all of them their own chapters um, to you know, tell their own stories. Um, but to also share their own perspective on this uh, group of people, I mean, this family, um, to reflect on their roles within this family, but also to um, yeah, to 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 actually, um, I mean, their father died, so they're confronted with you know the, the their own mortality, uh, so all the characters look back at their lives in a new way. Um, that, that was briefly the idea of the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there are sort of multiple displacements that occur. Um, you know, it's a Turkish Kurdish family. So there's the language shift from Kurdish to Turkish and then to German um, and uh, the question of gender comes up as well in yeah. really interesting ways, but okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the, 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 it's a, I think what I can uh, add to that is that it's um, like one of the main motives maybe in, in, in the book is, um, is the fluidity of everything somehow, um, the fluidity of the identity within the family. Um, also because, um, you know, from the outside, they may seem like, oh, this is this Turkish family who came from Turkey to Germany, but somehow not everybody in that family defines themselves as Turkish as well, because there's also the Kurdish heritage, which was, uh, which became invisible through time. And um, yeah, and then there's also the, the question of gender, but I don't want to get too deep into that because I would be speaking too much about the plot. And there are sort of wonderful references to popular culture around along the way uh, that uh, both in, in the Turkish and the German context. But um, that's, uh, you know, so we could only give a, a little flavor, but I, I do warmly recommend uh, reading the book. Um, and uh, then, you know, people who have questions should probably type them into the chat since uh, um, since um, time is, is um, running away from us. Uh, and uh, John, uh, the next step is? Uh... Yeah, I, I was wondering if maybe we could have also a very brief reading from Hengame's novel. I think there's a lot of parallels in terms of you know, tracing generational trauma, um, things like this, and maybe we could bring that into the conversation at the end. And I think probably more people in our audience today have read this than have read the sneak preview of Jin's. Yes, I'm going to read uh, from the first chapter of my book. Eigentlich heule ich nicht laut. Ich habe es in dem Moment verlernt, als Mama und meinem siebenjährigen Ich in einem spöttischen Ton erklärte, dass laut heulende oder überhaupt heulende Mädchen hässlich seien. Und welches Kind will das schon? Dick, ausländisch, schwach und hässlich sein. Aber in diesem Augenblick ist alles vergessen. Alle Regeln, jede Sprache, mein eigenes Gesicht. Tränen, Regen, das Ende der Welt, alles prasselt eimerweise auf meine haarigen Zehen. Sie hat immer gesagt, 
ein Ende ist immer auch ein Anfang. Manchmal ist es halt der Anfang von etwas Beschissenem. Ein hupendes Auto reißt mich zurück. Seine Scheinwerfer blenden mich. Mit einem Reifen steht es auf dem Gehsteig. Ich stelle fest, dass es eine Einfahrt ist, die ich mit meinem mächtigen Körper blockiere. Der Fahrer macht hektische Handzeichen. Bist du schwer vom Begriff oder was? Ruft er durch sein heruntergekurbeltes Fenster. Ich schaue ihn schweigend an und frage mich, ob es ihm das wert war, die Scheibe herunterzulassen und seinen Regenschutz aufzugeben, nur um einen Spruch zu drücken. Was für ein dummer Wichser, hält sich wohl für besonders geil, weil er das Gesetz der Straße durchboxt. Überfahr mich doch, du Hundesohn, will ich brüllen, aber ich sage nichts und gehe weiter. Unter jeder noch so durchlässigen Überdachung stehen Menschen auf der Sonnenallee dicht aneinander gedrängt, obwohl der Wind sicherstellt, die Nässe trotzdem von allen Seiten in ihre Richtung zu wehen. Ich laufe an ihnen vorbei, sie sind mir egal, genau wie die vorbeirasenden Autos, die mich im Minutentakt mit dem dreckigen Wasser aus den Pfützen am Straßenrand vollspritzen. Alles schwimmt an mir vorbei, nur der hellbraune Fleck auf meiner Brust nicht. Wer hätte gedacht, dass Erdnusssoße so sturmresistent ist? In diesem Moment ist dieser Fleck das Relikt einer Zeit, auf die ich nun keinen Zugriff mehr habe. Dabei ist er nur einige Stunden alt. Er manifestierte sich auf meinem Shirt, als ich nach meiner Schicht auf dem Bordstein vor dem sudanesischen Imbiss saß und die nächtliche Anonymität genoss, in der ich ungestört mit meinem Sandwich rummachen konnte. Der Inhalt landete überwiegend in meinem Mund, doch dieser große Klecks löste sich vom restlichen Sandwich und wurde im Fallen von meiner Brust abgefangen. Ich blickte mich um, niemand war in der Nähe, also zog ich mein Shirt zu meinem Mund hoch und leckte die Soße ab, bis nur noch ein dünner Film von ihr übrig blieb. Zu Hause angekommen war ich so erschöpft, dass ich mich auf die Matratze legte und die Augen schloss. Ich erinnere mich nicht mehr daran, was ich träumte. Ich weiß nur, dass ich irritiert war, als die Türklingel mich weckte. Vor meinem Fenster zitterten die Äste, dahinter grauer Himmel. Der Wind schlug sie gegen meine Scheibe wie eine Vorwarnung. I think I'm gonna stop here because we're like running out of time. Thank you. Yeah, that's fine. I can just read like a paragraph. Um, so we actually have a sample translation here of Ministry of Dreams from Aicha Tukulu, who is herself a very prolific translator of German and Turkish literature. And I have the whole first chapter, but I think I'll just read maybe a paragraph. On Zonenale, people are packed close together under every leaking awning, though the wind makes sure the rain reaches them from every angle. I walk by, but they don't register with me, just like the cars that tear past, spraying me with dirty water from roadside puddles at regular one minute intervals. It all passes me by, except for the light brown mark on my chest. Who would have thought that peanut sauce was so storm resistant? In this moment, the stain is a relic of a time I can't access anymore. It's only a couple of hours old manifesting on my shirt as I sat on the curb outside the Sudanese place after my shift, enjoying the anonymity of nighttime, spending private time with my sandwich, undisturbed. The vast majority of its contents found their way into my mouth, but a great blob liberated itself from the rest and was caught in the trap of my chest. I looked around. There was no one nearby, so I pulled my shirt up to my mouth and licked the sauce off until a thin film was all that remained. When I got home, I was so exhausted that I lay on my mattress and shut my eyes. I can't remember what I dreamed about. All I know is I was annoyed when the doorbell woke me. Branches quivered outside my window with the gray sky behind them and the wind made them knock at the glass like a warning. Thank you, John. You. Thank you, John. Uh, so I think, um, you know, we, we can use the remaining time to also address questions from the audience. And uh, I can start with one question that came to us from, um, uh, from three of our graduate students, uh, Elizabeth Soon, uh, um, uh, uh, Freya Zhu, and Ver Verena Wolf. Uh, 
Um, and uh, I think it fits in nicely here after the reading of the two fictional pieces, uh, because they are uh, saying, I'm going to read it now, readers often have a tendency to see literature on the topics of migration, identity, and queerness as at least partially autobiographical. Um, is this something you desire to move away from as you continue your work as artistic individuals? Or would you like to like your creative endeavors to be socio-politically connected? Um, so basically, it is interesting to think about the trajectory from the pieces in the anthology that were also more um, first person, you know, essays uh, in some way um, uh, to, to these uh, fictional narratives and uh, how you see um, the, you know, how, how you see the autobiographical still mattering in, in, in these uh, fictionally crafted uh, or, or, you know, so, um, uh, in the novels, basically. Okay, I'll start. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I, um, well, my book, the two novels that I have written so far, um, they're not um, autobiographic, but I can see that there is a tendency that if you, as an author, um, belong to a marginalized group, um, of any sort, and if the characters in the story belong to a marginalized group, that there's a tendency, at least uh, in the press, uh, that literary critics um, will not read your work solely as a piece of literature, but like um, a representation of a certain group or as a product of um, identity politics. I, I use the air quotes because everybody uses the term in a different way and there's something else by saying it right now. But um, yeah, it's always kind of like, um, I'm asked a lot, or I, I have the feeling that my work is often characterized as a statement against the German literary establishment. Um, and I think that's interesting because I um, I would say my novel my novel is political, and I would say my novel is political, but I don't think, like, I think every novel is political in a way. And if it's, the author pretends it's not, then this is also a political statement. So, um, yeah, I just, um, I mean, I, I don't think I chose to write about an immigrant family because I wanted to challenge the establishment. It's just part of my reality. It doesn't have to be my personal biography or, you know, the story of my, uh, of my family, uh, one-on-one. -on -one. But, um, of course, when I make things up when I create fictional worlds and fictional characters, of course, they're always um, created out of things that I have absorbed, stories I've heard and experienced. So um, coming back to that question, because there was like, um, if I understood it right, there was like, it, it was um, asked as if it is like a contradiction to be, um, to write sociopolitically connected um, or to walk away from that autobiographical writing, I don't think it's really contradictory. I think um, I can write fictional and yeah, still um, produce a literary work that's social politically connected. Yeah, there is a collectivizing aspect to the narration that uh that in my opinion also occurs through all those references to, to very pointed references to, to shared popular culture. Uh, so, so there is a way in which the, the autobiographical maybe factors in, but it also becomes part of a, a collective uh, biography um, uh, in, in, in some ways or, or history of, of the whole kind of migration. Uh, yeah. Mm, so, so, uh, do we? 
And one thing I would like to add to that is just that um, it's um, it's also, you know, um, I don't know how it is with you, Hengame, maybe like it would be interesting to hear that from you too, but I have the feeling that um, I'm also like within this German uh, literary discourse or in interviews or on stage, it happens so often that I'm being asked about Uh, my personal experiences or my biography in order to get, you know, proof for the authenticity of what I'm writing. Does that happen to you as well? Yes. Um, so everything that Fatma has said, I uh, can only second. And definitely in um, most of the interviews that I gave about my novel, the topic of literature was only like second row and mostly it was a lot of personal stuff trying to like find out how many percentage of you is in the main character or um, also I think something that a lot of especially non-male um, racialized authors get is like did your parents read the book what do your parents think about the book um, like trying to get into um yeah like very autobi like biographical mm -hmm. or like uh, personal fears um the, but, the the kind of the the autobiographization occurs in the reception really and in in the framing lot, yeah. Uh, yeah but then along those lines of course i'm also interested in you know how how Did you place your book with Hansa? You know how how did that become possible? Um, you know, and uh, since you know your books are are appearing, you know, are, are published by uh, renowned uh, publishing houses. So, and then we have another question from Elizabeth here, who says, uh, you know, how does social class, uh, the question of class factor. Uh, into your the way you think about politics, um, uh, and and also into your narratives. I think it factors. Uh, you know, there is a sort of negotiation of social class going on also. Mm -hmm. mm, I mean, I would say mm, something that is like a main layer of the politics I have is anti-capitalism, which is like not. It has to do with class, but um, I myself do not come from a working class family. I have a middle class background, but I don't. I don't think that it means you cannot be lefty, which some liberals sometimes like to mix up. Um, and for example, um, the um, uh, characters that I chose in my novel. Um, they are workers like the main character is a bouncer and um but i don't think that and that is i mean that goes beyond class you don't necessarily have to only write about your own experiences because it is not autobiographical but um because we were talking about so many racialized authors like stepping up being published more i think it is important to talk about class as well because um the pe uh, people who get to like published novels most of them have also like um had access to uh, like most people that i know who have published books have uh, studied or like an academical background um or um like access to like people who are in like certain establishments. And I guess even like um, what is even more dominant when we want to talk about a glass ceiling or something is not necessarily just race, but also class. So we have another question from an audience member. Um, sort of building off of the earlier discussion of the rejection of this notion of Heimat, uh, if either of you or both of you would be willing to instead maybe give a definition for rather than homeland, home, 
and how you conceptualize this feeling or place of home uh, in opposition perhaps to you know, a discourse of Heimat? Um, yeah, I, I would refer to um, one of the essays in our book, uh, this, which is called Home, actually, it's the whole Maybe the English translation, John, is it home or at I think home? It's home? Home. I think it's home. Uh, it's by Simone de de um, uh, Simone is a theater director and an author, and I um, really, really like that uh, text. I also read it often. You know, we give readings of Hang on Me to the two of us because um, people cannot invite 14 authors. Obviously, so uh, we but we read texts from other authors at that readings, and I really enjoy reading Simone's text there. So yeah, I would just um, answer with uh, this text, which is about um, or there's this concept of being home means being with you guys, and with you guys she means allies and friends and you know people she. Um, um, is in solidarity with, who are in solid, solidarity with her and who um, work together and struggle together for a better tomorrow. And, you know, it's a long essay. She's explaining it uh, in a very uh, accessible and visual language, I think, what she means by that. But, um, yeah, basically it's... Um, it's, um, it's a love uh, letter to her um, community, to anti-racist and anti-fascist activists, but also people who are, you know, not may maybe um, active on street protests, but like baking cakes for the activists or taking care of their children, et cetera, et cetera. Just like a, a community supporting each other. And um, yeah, I would say home is for me, people, basically the people that, um, that I love and that uh, I'm in solidarity with. So, so, I mean, one comment here in the chat says, so it's belonging, not a place, right? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, and, you know, there's another question. Uh, we are running out of time here, but, um, you know, whether if you look at Eure Heimat ist unser Albtraum now through the uh, 2021 translation uh, or the, the you know, publication of the entire thing in translation, um, you know, uh, would you, um, you know, how, how do you see this project also speaking uh, to uh, the English language audience and uh, to the future? Are there any different concepts, issues that you would revisit uh, in, 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 with regard to the, the current situation? Um, and uh, yeah, is there, um, we could end on that note of what's in the future <laughs> with regard to. Mm -hmm. I think for an English speaking audience and especially one that is based in the US, it is always a question of what do I get out of it if they are asked to read something that is not about the US, um, not, like no front. Um, also people in Germany are more interested in the US than in Germany. Um, but I guess um, there's parallel parallels and differences and i think it's always interesting um especially when it comes to concepts um that come from like uh, critical race theory or like anti-racist activism how fragile uh, on the one hand how fragile they are and how they can um swift from one um like continent to the other but also um, how there is like parallels and how we can get together, like both the differences and the parallels. Plus it can at least be entertaining because I think um, the essays are either funny or poetical or um, 
like emo or all of the above. Um, and I think that, um, yeah, you can, I mean, also some, some of the essays are very specific to Germany and some are more general and do not necessarily only have to do with living in Germany or Austria. John can chime in there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think I completely agree. Uh, we're used to, you know, reading English language theory for a lot of these concepts. And, you know, in an international context, English is often the academic or the, the language of public discourse. And I think it's really important to look at examples coming from other parts of the world, whether that be, you know, Central Europe or Latin America, making these kind of texts available early anywhere um, is important. And we see that there is a continuity, uh, as Hengame said, you know, there are specificities here and some of these texts speak to specifically German experiences. But, you know, I think the experience of marginalization or the desire for belonging, these are as close to, you know, universal experiences as we get. And so having, you know, voices from other parts of the world, you know, expands our understanding of the same issues here and brings people into conversation that might not necessarily be in conversation otherwise. I mean, one question, of course, is whether these voices are all beginning to sound, to sound alike, you know, so because certain uh, concepts are, are traveling uh, quite uh, uh, freely and circulating uh, through uh, social media and uh, internationalist discourse. So, so it's, it's also interesting how some of these discourses have kind of uh, uh, traveled from the US context to Germany and now they're coming back again. Um, yeah, certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think that those parallels are definitely there, um, but having these specifically German examples helps to sort of show how that translates from, you know, culture or language to, you know, a different culture or language. Yeah, I can attest to that. So uh, there were, it, it, the text resonated with students uh, who read them in English um, also last, last semester. Um, so um, any closing remarks uh, since we are, uh, I don't think there are any, any more comments here. Uh, closing remarks from our uh, Fatma. Uh, <laughs> it's no, getting I mean, late late in Berlin. You must yeah, be tired. It's quite, <laughs> it's quite late. Uh, yeah. No, I don't have anything to add. I just wanted to thank you for inviting us for this talk. And thank you also um, for John for the um, translation work, organizing everything and having this idea. We're so grateful um, for having the English translations of our work. So thanks a lot. Yeah, well, thank you for the cooperation and yeah. for, you know, taking the time to do this. Yeah, thanks. Thank you all for making time. Um, this yes, was the late hour. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, we hope that conversations will continue. <laughs> uh, congratulations on your books. Um, and um, yeah, the audience is thanking too. Um, as I said, the, the next installments in the series are going to be with uh, Jenny Erpenbeck on March 18 and Mitu Sanyal, who, you all, who was already mentioned today and who is part of the uh, anthology as well uh, on April 8. Uh, so that's in the future for us in terms of these Zoom conversations. Uh, thank you all very much. And bye bye. <laughs> Thank you.